Table talk. Yeah, let's Still do it. Awake. <laughs> Somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay, we have a few questions. Let's go through okay. these. Okay. Oh okay, yeah, let's go with this one. Does revival represent what normal Christianity should be, or is it something extraordinary? Well, Martin Lloyd Jones would say it's extraordinary, but we ought to be looking for it. So, in a sense, it's got an ordinary aspect to it. Yeah. Well, you can't go wrong when you quote Martin Lloyd Jones on, yeah. on revival, really. That's sort of the. The, uh, uh, the winning streak. It, we should think of it as, as ordinary in terms of could happen at any point. Yeah. Yeah. There's no reason that we should think um, we, you know, at this period or at this sort of uh, stage or chapter of church history or at this sort of uh, 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 point in the kingdom or in the dispensation of the gospel or whatever you, you might say, it, it, we should not think that we can't have it now because it was... If by extraordinary you mean exclusively limited in that level to the early church and the book of Acts and the time of the apostles, or it's the un only the sort of thing you see as a new land or a new nation is uh, 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 penetrated by the gospel and missionaries, you know, um, uh, we should be seeking it and, uh, and exhorting ourselves with this ought to be normal. If, if revival is filled with all sorts of extraordinary things that distract from the local church and fixate us on things other than Jesus, then, then not only should, should we think of it extraordinary, we should think of it as negative. But since revival really is just all the normal stuff that the, of the, that the church is to do, preach, see the, the spirit convict souls, lead them to truth and conversion, that turned up to the level of the book of Acts, which yes. is our only yes. inspired church history account, if that was happening, that we would all call, every historian and theologian would call that revival. So in that sense, pursuing a Paul, a, a, an apostle Paul level of church ministry and fruit, expecting that kind of result as we do his kind of ministry, in that sense, I would want to say it's we should think of it as ordinary. Extraordinary works of God done in ordinary means. Yeah. Yeah. That's what some yeah. of you say sometimes. Yeah. Um, how many people need to be converted for historians to consider something a revival? What makes them consider it as a revival? Let's go Dr. Craig with this one. Yeah, okay. I should have said something in the last one. I'll get singled out. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's two important components, right? So we think about the kind of the quantifiable, the numeric amount of souls being converted. But we also talk about kind of the, the, the time frame. Right? So if we've got a, a church that proclaims the gospel, it rightly administers the ordinances, it disciples their converts, they're going to be having converts happen regularly and routinely by God's grace. And let's say in a calendar year they, they boast 200 baptisms. That's pretty incredible, right? We probably wouldn't call it revival unless it happened in one Sunday or maybe in one week. So it's not just the number per se. It, it's almost very much... What's the speed? And if you can see this momentum building, and there's a, there's a fervency, and there's something unique about the atmosphere and the engagement of the people, there's more criteria to this than just yeah. how many souls are converted. But I don't want to dismiss that. It is an important consideration. I know some people that write on revival, they're considered authorities on revival, and what they tend to do is they kind of change the definition for just a heightened season of fervency, right? There's not really any actual fruit. The kingdom isn't expanding by conversions. And so I, I say we, we could call that any number of things, but calling it a revival is, is suspect. So I know the questioner probably wanted me to give you the threshold number, right? It has to be more than or, or you know, within this bracket. Probably unhelpful. What we are more saying is that a quantifiable number of conversions in a rapid, unusual period of time will be what we intend to describe as a revival. But almost always... After the fact, yeah. kind of often in hindsight, you look back and you say, yes. we've had three amazingly fruitful Sundays in church, we're in a season. Mm. So I think it was, uh, speaking of Dr. Adams' statement on the Pyrrhons and Providence, I think it was John Flavel, the Pyrrhon, who said, God's providences must always be read like Hebrew backward. Yeah. Like you, you, you can't really stop here and start thinking about revivals coming in November, like we've booked the venue, we've got the speed, right? Like it's all about looking at what God's doing in that season and then assessing what those marks and those signs are, usually with some hindsight. So 
it'd be fair to say we could only call it a revival looking back. We couldn't in the moment say this is a revival happening right now or? So I will say that you could, it's not a, it's not a hard no, but a lot of people have done that in the moment and have been found to be premature, to be overly optimistic, and I'm, I'm the optimistic guy, but you have a Sunday where there's six conversions and you start billeting that as revival. If it was the opening day of revival, you may have hindered it. You, you may have done something to contaminate it by being overly optimistic and you're kind of parading that as something spectacular. It, it's normally better to let the spirit move and, and to watch that and to pray for that and to excite that and, and to get, you know, get really fervent about it and encourage people. To say we're in revival uh, often makes more false prophets than helpful prophecies, I find. Yeah, mm. Mm. yeah I was also going to add as a uh, historical, not just a historical question, but also as like a historological or a historiographic question in terms of not just what happened in history, but also how are they counting things in history? Yes. And some, uh, that's a big part of um, uh, where your theology is going to yeah. interpret, not just should revival happen and what should it look like, but also, though I'll see them in heaven, they're my brothers, might I count conversions differently to other people in the past who had a different theology of me, uh, to me about, about regeneration, say, or about whether you can lose your salvation. So uh, this would not to be pessimistic or even or hypercritical about, uh, uh, for example, Methodist revivals that happened in the past, which I love reading. And they, they uh, if somebody asked me the other day, if you could be uh, any Christian uh, uh, in a, among any Christian group in any time of history, what would it be? And I said, mid-1800s Australian Methodists, those guys were awesome. But they might still also be counting some conversions who got saved last year but fell away. And as a Reformed Baptist would not count that as a conversion, but maybe either a, uh, either a conversion or a recoming, because you can't lose your salvation. So might the same 200 this year be the same as 200 last year? That actually starts uh, casting some aspersion upon the whole thing. So um, uh, uh, in other words, it's not just um, uh, what numbers are on the paper, can we call that a revival, but also how are they counting that? Uh, 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 and, you know, the Methodists, they were... Um, well, I mean, that's how they got the name. They're methodistic. Yep. They were really systematic in how they counted things. Mm. You all know the labels better than me. But they used to have, um, after the, uh, they, they would have their church members and then the congregation would be all the other people who were there. If you came down the front with a broken heart over sin, they called you a penitent. Yeah. If you were seeking, the, did they call, was a seeker the next yes. stage in? Yeah. If you were really seeking salvation, they would call you a seeker. And then if you, they would have phrases like found peace. Like if, you, if you closed with Christ and you got saved that night, they would say you were a conversion. And so they would have like after their prayer meetings or in the times of revival, they would, they would count all of the stats and they would say we had... 300 come for as penitents, 200 were seekers, and 112 conversions. And, um, I mean, every movement has its good and bad. And, so, like, Spurgeon sort of mocked a Methodist back in London during the uh, revivals of 59 and 60 there. And he was mocking this guy who's down the street saying, This week we had... 42 uh, 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 penitents, uh, uh, 38 justified, 12 of them fully sanctified, and 13 about to be justified. You go, what? How do you? That's sort of what what Craig was thinking. You can't like look. Not only can you look forward and say, "Oh, a revival is about to happen," you also can't look within and know for certain or count your eggs before they hatch. They might say. So that's one thing. Is as we look back on history. Who is counting them? As I'm reading books, uh, how much also is this guy maybe so inspired like I am when you're reading accounts mm -hmm. of revival to start notching everything up as a win? Mm -hmm. So we want to be accurate with like history, but um, uh, uh, all of that to hopefully go in uh, uh, to help us interpret history the best we can. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, I, I think the people I know who are involved generally tend to be conservative. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but there are those who, are, who academically wouldn't be counted who are very generous. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's important to err on the side of caution. Yeah. I think it's vital. And look, we could get really complex because the whole matter of entire sanctification with the Methodists, yeah. which I didn't talk about at yeah. all, but that's sort of an additional yeah. element to it. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that would probably answer. Someone had a question, how would a Reformed Baptist distinctive yeah. uh, differ to any of these other denominations in revival, then that probably just answered your question. Do you have any other 
comments on that? Well, I don't think anyone's brought up Charles Finney yet, and I was sort of waiting to hear someone mention... That's your session. Uh, That's what what you get. Finneyism and... (laughs) And 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 Craig. He'll he'll have a huge influence on tomorrow's lecture that I... All right. Yeah, well, maybe maybe I leave it, but I'll I'll just make this comment. Where Finney had his largest meetings, revivals, uh, conversion accounts was in Rochester, New York, where I pastored for a number of years with with my family at, at a church there. And uh, it's still today called the Burned Over District because such was the revival fires of the Second Great Awakening under Finney. Now, Finney didn't just believe that you could lose salvation. Finney believed that you certainly lost it the moment you committed your first sin after having saved faith. Mm. So Finney would ride into town, particularly Rochester, and the town was about 25, 30,000 people in the the late 1820s. And Finney would have revival. They'd all get saved because he was so brilliant and engaging and eloquent and precise he would have them all smitten for sin, which they committed that morning over breakfast, right? And then he'd have them saved, yeah. and then, he'd, yeah, he'd come back a year later, <laughs> and he'll get them converted again. So you have to be careful when you're reading Finney's accounts of revivals. Theology is desperately suspect, mm. um, and Finney would, would teach the people, if the last, sin, the last thing you do on earth before you die is a sin, you're outside of grace. You got, so your, your salvation hangs in the balance at any moment. And so for someone like Finney to kind of preach that very forcefully, it's easy to rack up the numbers. You can imagine how that would be. There's one revival in 1830. He counted 100,000 conversions. Maybe a third of those had been through his revivals three or four times. Mm. So we'll get into more of that tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Probably the, if you, people would be surprised, but if we were talking today, like what might certain movements of Christianity and evangelicalism and Protestantism, if we were to all sort of seek or see revival or define revival in our midst, today, Reformed Baptists would probably, even the way that we described it tonight, the theological assumptions I made tonight, Mm. would set us as far away from certain other groups as they would want to set themselves apart from us. Um, uh, but if we traveled back probably uh, before liberalism swept through in the 1920s and onwards, um, before um, uh, feminism and before uh, a lot of the, the, the cultural uh, revolution and everything, uh, you know, I was, even, I was just reading Ian Murray again today on the early Australian Christian life, mm-hmm. and he was counting in this just heartbreaking, heart-wrenching manner at the end of the book after you read all these tremendous stories of God's move and the way he strengthened and planted churches through dying missionaries lives and then you get to the end and it's just so what happened and he just says well Methodism yeah here's this prophetic word of John Watsford and he goes oh if we neglect the prayer meeting And if we neglect the primacy of the preaching of the inspired word and the proclamation of the gospel, it will not matter how much money we have, how many spirit-filled meetings we might seem to have, how charismatic the teacher, if we neglect these, Methodism will die. And it was just a few decades later that that started to seep in. And now today, Methodism is one of the wokest, weakest, most pathetic apostate denominations in the West. Like, you want to make a joke about rainbow lady pastors carrying their dogs to baptize on stage. You make it about the United Methodists or whatnot. There, there's some saints among them, but that, that, like, that's them today. They've become a byword. And um, uh, so, so anyway, but before that great shift happened, really, the early guys, whether they were Presbyterian, and back then they were very unified. Like, yeah, they they're were. very distinct in their theology, but they worked yeah. together. Presbyterians, Baptists, Reformed Baptists, Methodists, mm. Congregationalists. Um, they still, uh, evangelical Anglicans, they were still, like, if you listen to them preach today, you'd go, you're a Bible-thumping yeah, fundamentalist absolutely. from 2020, because no one says that anymore. Bible's inspired, Jesus is the only way to salvation, preaching the cross, atonement in the blood. Um, so maybe back then, as I'm reading them, this is historiography sort of lens on, as I'm reading the Methodists then, I'm less likely to think of them um, this is unlikely a real revival, as I am maybe my friends today who are in ministry in other denominations whose theology is even more whack than the Wesleyans who believed in perfect holiness of the 18, you know, 1830s. So I, I think that it's very salutary when you think about, I've shared with you something about the extraordinary blessing that they experienced in the Methodist Church in our early history. Phenomenal. But I know, because I lived through uniting phase and I saw Methodism go from some godly men to the point where I could in in New South Wales 
can count on one hand evangelical ministers. And so by the 1970s, they were largely so liberal. Mm. In such a short time, yeah. those who were most used of God became the most apostate. And it's telling you true. Mm. You know? Be careful. You know, if you think you stand, you might fall. Yes. And so you've got to guard the gospel. Yeah. You've got to guard the truth. And there's an important lesson for us to learn. Mm. Just because you've been greatly blessed doesn't mean that you will continue. Uh, this question is directed at you, Dr. Adams. Um, I know you put on your PowerPoint three different slides of revivals throughout Australia's history. This person asks, why have Australian revivals been so forgotten or not uh, publicly made aware compared to, you mentioned the Great Awakenings in America and Great Britain. You know, we read books about this all the time. Why don't we know about these Australian revivals? Yeah, I, you know, I've given it a lot of thought. I, I do think the power of secularism mm. and modernism that influenced Australia. And so it became so powerful and because we're a young nation, we quickly lost those stories. Mm. And when you think one of the main drivers of this story, the Methodist Church, they turned away from the Word of God and became so liberal. Mm. Presbyterians, when I was around, you know, in, in the 70s, liberal. Uh, congregationalist, liberal. Mm. Uh, and, and so, in a sense, those stories didn't mean much to them. Mm. And so they weren't being shared and told. Mm. And I do think the influence of, of um, secular academia mm. didn't want those stories. Mm. A bit harder in the USA, and a bit harder because when you've got the Great Awakening and the politicians that were affected by that, in the history of Britain, it protected them from going down the revolution route. Mm. You can't pretend that it never happened. Mm. That's my answer. Yeah, one time I inherited like a hundred really solid theology books from a uh, Presbyterian minister who I thought had died, and a friend was given them to me. Like, awesome, thank you so much. Um, sorry to hear that you know he's passed, obviously, because I'm getting all these uh, books. And he's, nah, he's he's good. He inherited these. He just he don't want anything to do with them. He was throwing them out. I grabbed them. I thought you'd want them. Gone through all these banner of truth books. He's amazing. Like what? Why? And I look him up. I'm like, who's throwing this out? Liberal. He'd inherited the strong church had nothing for these amazing books, threw it all out so he could read Richard Rohr and, oh. and the rest, right? That's what it's kind of like. The, the guys who wrote all this down have all the stats on these amazing revivals are the people who care least for their history of actual evangelical revivals, some of the really woke churches. So, so they, they have it probably stored yeah. somewhere. Somebody has got some gold nugget of Christian Australian history of revivals with, with individuals like I'm reading John Watsford's and he, he says at the end of his life, I've turned to my page where I have written the 600 conversions that happened in whatever. I'm like, where is that diary? We want those books. They're somewhere. But, it, but they've not been treasured by their own spiritual heritage, so they've, they've, they, we can't find them. The other is the tyranny of distance that historians yes. talk about in Australia. Yes. Like, all this, the, 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 the cities across all Australia that uh, Dr. Adams was showing us that saw revival in that period, if that was in Europe, that'd be like seven different countries. Mm. Now this enormous, right before motor cars like we have today, just enormous distance between all of these cities. So, so you, uh, uh, the, 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 the accumulation of these facts and sort of the unionizing around these was harder to do, as well as we were a young, poor nation. We didn't have all of our own publishing houses and universities to print out all this stuff. So it was, there's a lot, you know, we're so young. So there's a lot going against Australia to sort of keep these, but probably the most, if we were to be cynical or accurate, would be the bleaching of the Australian history by secularists, sort of post 50s and 60s, yes. where um, I was reading Piggin on it and he's saying, you know, even Australian secularists sound in their values and what, what they're actually p pursuing in a good society without religion. Australian secularists are more Christian than they realize. Yes. And by, by default also, Australian Christians are way more secular than you yes. realise. Yeah. So it's not just 
that we've been lied to and sort of hidden and a lot of those histories have been buried or put away, we also have imbibed yes. the, the water we, we swim in and we have become discipled by a secularist kind of view of the world. We don't believe in providence much anymore, God active in history and working. Um, so all of those things sort of come together with liberalism, the rest, to really throw those things aside and, and uh, yeah, so people just believe the trope. It'd be great if Australia could see at least one revival. And I'll, I'll just add to that. This growing secularism um, and, and postmodernism. So that they would say, well, even if it's true, that was truth in the past. Mm, yeah. And it's not our truth now. Mm. And we're not the nation of the past. In fact, we've got to, we've got to turn aside from that. Mm. And we've got to pursue, because that, that's that Judeo-Christian mindset and look how much harm is brought. Mm -hmm. So we want to forge forward in our postmodern, you know, non-definite worldview. Mm. How's that going for us? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, what is the more practical question now? Let's get one from each of the speakers uh, more, uh, for the audience. What's the greatest blocker to seeing revival in our nation. As you know, Christians, what could we do practically to uh, see Australia have this revival that we're all praying for and expecting? Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll kick this one off. Just because you triggered me by how you asked the question, Chris, yeah. we are not expecting. That's the greatest hindrance. Look around. This place should be bursting at the seams. Mm. Um, we could organize and schedule prayer meetings until we're blue in the face. We can talk revival, read books, publish, propagate ideas and stir people up by revival. But all of that ends up being the vanity of vanities of Ecclesiastes unless there's a genuine anticipation that God delights to give revival and we believe that he delights to smile upon us in that way as well it starts there because easy answers are the pulpit can be reformed that's true prayer meetings can be better attended that's true we can become better educated in revival that's all true but those things are downstream of yeah. genuine fervent heartfelt expectancy mm -hmm. so i think that's where i would yeah i would answer that I think that's backed up by um, a really interesting question of why did certain people or groups or denominations see revival in our nation's history or even other nations' histories and not others? Like why not more in the present? Or why, why not if we're all going to just put on the Reformed Baptist cap for tonight, thank you doctor, um, and the rest of you who aren't, if we go, well if the Reformed Baptists are the most right, why don't we, why don't we see the revival? Or at least in history, why don't we see the most revival? Um, and it seems to be um, that it was those who had the bare minimum of the gospel message still there, not heretical on that, right? But who had the grandest sense of expectation seemed to, to be met by the Lord in, 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 with the gift of revival, more so than how theologically systematized and right you were. So that even the people who got so much wrong or who I disagree with a lot on theology or even their practice, they go, but so inflamed with a, with a genuine expectancy that God was more willing to be glorified by them, weaknesses and all, than they were, than he was by those who had more right, but didn't expect this God that they knew so well to really do much through his son and spirit. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd back that up. I'd probably say on, on an instrumental or sort of a practical level, um, because the cross is not being preached. The blood, the atonement, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and his resurrection for sinners, that is not being preached genuinely. Now, um, you know, it's not enough just to preach it. You have to expect that it's going to have results. But I remember years ago, I think it was your definition of evangelism one day at an evangelism conference at Hope. And you said evangelism is preaching the gospel, can I do it? blah, blah, can blah, I, can, can with I yada, 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 yada. Can I use explicit Remember gospel it? proclamation that anticipates a positive response? Yeah. That anticipates. Yes. 
a positive response. That is, you're actually preaching, and you've, you've saved some time, that once you stop preaching, you're going to meet the people who got converted. Because why wouldn't you? Well, you're just going to preach? You're just going to sow the seed as you drive past in your four-wheel drive and never come to the field again? Like, you're going to preach and then expect something to happen. And that has sort of been wrapped up in, when I say we're not preaching the cross, it's not even enough to just explain the atonement. I mean, that wrapped up into it. Are you preaching the cross with the expectation that the Spirit is using that to bring forth through that seed of life, the word of Jesus Christ, life in new souls who are going to be converted and want to, want to flee to Christ. So, yeah, preaching the cross does... Even people who mention the cross and mention Jesus often mention him in their pulpits as a great example or a show of love. Jesus loves you, whatever. But they're not preaching, proclaiming, extolling the work of, of, of blood on the cross of Jesus Christ, which is the, 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 um, the, 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 the instrumentation which the Spirit uses to give life to dying souls. So preaching the cross, but by that I also mean expecting it to do what it did. Who, who said apostolic methods yield apostolic results or something like that? Ian Bounds. Craig. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Ian Bounds, thank you. So I would agree with the importance of the anticipation and expectation. So it's faith. Mm. Um, and I agree as well with the preaching and, of course, the cross. Mm. I would also add something else, but the cross ultimately, but the doctrine of God. Mm. Yeah. I really think, and this is where I love my Reformed Baptist brethren, particularly in the States, the work that they're doing on the doctrine of God, the simplicity of God, you know, the aseity of God. And when you see God that way, yeah. of course you're just going to bow down before him because he is truly great. The creator-creature distinction is, it blows your mind. God, who is infinite, you know, he, he's above logic. So that's why it's a joke when people want, you know, prove to me God logically. But when you say, well, God created all, God is infinite. Mm. Our capacity is so minimal compared to infinity. It's nothing. So that's why we read in the Old Testament, or Paul re refers it to, who are you, the clay, to say to the potter, what are you doing? And when you, when you see God and his greatness, Wow. Um, and, and then you see the, the glory of the cross, which, yeah. which is the means to be um, in relationship with God. Um, and, and I would also add with the anticipation and expectation, prayer. Yeah. Because, I mean, they really prayed. Mm, yes. And they really expected and anticipated. It was real for them. Mm. And, and I'll be honest, I, I was in a denomination and we had covenant as Reformed Presbyterians, we had covenanted to pray. We'd spend a whole day regularly on a Saturday from morning till evening as a, as a group just praying for revival. But unfortunately with us, we were living in the historic past of revival. So our Reformed theology was fantastic, but it was all romanticising the past. So we were living in the past there wasn't a real sense of anticipation for the present. Mm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Uh, would it be true to say, this uh, question asked, that we've seen more revivals in history past than we do closer to our time period now? So I know Dr. Adams is going to speak on a bit more modern yeah. revivals in Australia, sure. but would that be a true statement? I honestly would say, in, in our context, Yes. What's going on in China or has been going on in China in the past with the home church movement, um, conversions are happening in, in areas of the Middle East, you know, even in Iran and places like that. Yeah. There may be revivals going on there in Africa. You know, there may be real genuine works that we're just not aware of. Absolutely. Being Eurocentric or British centric, we probably are not receptive mm. to those. But you know, there's been extraordinary work in in South Korea in the past. Mm. But yeah, and that's, that's something we need to think about. Why? 
yeah, I, I don't want any sense of preaching expected. Uh, revival is not just a, a, a bookend in the in the you know back end of history uh, to uh, say, preaching against that and saying we should expect it now does not need to be backed up by some false history that says. Oh, and we've been seeing it just as much as ever all over. You know, just open your eyes. The Australian church is great. No, majority, vast, vast, vast majority are shrinking. Uh, and uh, the, a small percentage of them have even grown by, in the last five years. Um, uh, because theology has results. And liberalism came into the church because most church leaders, even the solid reform guys, were absolute cowards and bureaucrats. And voted to tolerate and just see what happens. See, see whether or not this... Who was it? Angus in the Presbyterian yes, church? Angus. Angus was bringing in all of this. Oh, Jesus never told us what to believe. He's a great example. Uh, snip out some of those parts of the Bible. And he became the leading Presbyterian. Some of you are like, oh, this makes sense of my friend's Presbyterian church. Uh, uh, he was the leading Presbyterian theologian in Australia. And he was bringing in this liberalism and the... Presbyterian church got together and decided what to do with this Angus theology and their vote was see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> the, the legacy of John Knox. He came up with and heritage Garland. charges and, and no, they did nothing. And then just after him, a guy named Gearing, mm. exactly the same, who said, and he was training the Presbyterian ministers in Australia and he said, the, the bones of Jesus Christ are still rotting somewhere in Paris, in Palestine. Damn. Wow. That had an effect. Like that, that got into the, into the blood of the church and like where a couple of generations removed from that. It was weakened and then came in cultural uh, 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 revolution and feminism and all the other stuff. But, you know, that, that was really when the tide sinked. I know you'll be talking about that sort of thing way more tomorrow. But, yeah, it has an effect. So, of course, the call today is expect and preach the cross and get back to the Bible. And then we can expect to see. But we've definitely, uh, in the West, Anglophone area, you know, a, a Anglo world, yeah, we've, we've seen less recently. How do we discern genuine work of the Spirit compared to just falsified uh, people put on revivals? How do we discern a genuine revival? Do we um, leave that for Giuliano tomorrow? Yeah. Brother's going to bring a great word tomorrow. Yeah. Talking about excesses. Um, look, I think that any work that exalts Christ, as the scripture reveals him, any work that calls sin what sin is, that is the plague of plagues, and leads people to see the cross as a propitiatory sacrifice, as a penal substitutionary atonement, and exalt the resurrection and ascension of Christ, I think that... Whatever fervency goes behind that, you, you can be pretty safe to say that the word preached is a scriptural word. The church is, uh, the church is strengthened by that. And I don't think you have any real concerns, but I, I, I do know that uh, Pastor Giuliano tomorrow is going to talk about excesses and different things like that. So maybe I'm not going to steal his thunder, um, but I think we want to look at the content of a, of a revival. I remember, um, was it 2006? You guys remember the Lakeland outpouring oh, yes. with yeah. um, Todd Bentley? Bentley, yeah. And uh, it just, do you remember that, Tom? We were 13, I think, 2006. Let's go with um, that, yeah. Yeah, 18 now. So, that's right, and it was, it was, it was like everyone could, could kind of see how whack it was, how twisted, how messed up. But Bentley, at least for a number of weeks, would kind of tow a fairly safe line until toward the end of the revival. He didn't think it was the end, he thought it was building. He said, we're not here to exalt Jesus, we're here to exalt my angel that speaks to me every night and visits me and her name is I think Eleanor I don't know if I'm getting this right but it was like it's like Joseph yeah, Smith stuff all over yeah. again what was the angel's name do you remember no I think it was Eleanor oh wow I'm just shocked I remember that yeah but there were I, I will say this really solid Calvinistic Baptist churches in Brisbane that were live telecasting the entire revival in their services wow yeah I'm not making that up I visited one with my wife we had a Sunday off we were pastoring at the time uh, my wife will remember this. And we visited one that we were certain was going to preach the word, exalt Christ. We're going to meet some friends. The whole service, they put up a big screen and televised the chaos of this non-Jesus-centered, quote-unquote, revival. Um, uh, yeah, but Pastor Giuliano, I'll leave it for you for tomorrow. <laughs> I'll say for the fourth time and I'll actually stop this time. <laughs> Can I just mention very briefly, John chapter 16 Jesus talks about this. Hmm. When the Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin, yes. righteousness, 
and judgment. And he goes on to explain what he means by those. So that is, that, that's a fundamental. Now that is, you know, if that's truly happening, then that is the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jonathan Edwards does a great job yeah. too. Yeah. He gives a whole list of points. I, I wrote them down just in case a question came up about that. Mm -hmm. So there are some, there's a lot of good material that I'm looking forward to, to Juliana speaking about that. I'll let Juliana talk about it tomorrow, but also... Yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> We're writing a sermon for him. <laughs> Take notes. Take his thunder away. In that case, I think I've just realised we have gone 10 minutes over, so uh, that good will fashion. be us yeah. for the Q&A tonight. Yeah. Let's give a round of applause for <laughs> our speakers. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any more questions, write it down or keep sending them.